Welcome back to our tour of the primates. In this video, we'll be picking up where we left off with perhaps the greatest of the great apes, humans and other hominins. Of course, that greatness is totally arbitrary. All organisms have different sets of adaptations to suit their different environmental conditions and evolution isn't directional or has any sort of goal. Regardless, Hominins have evolved many interesting traits throughout their history, like complex sociality and culture. And that's certainly worth exploring from both an evolutionary and anthropological perspective. As we continue our overview of the hominid family tree, there are five evolutionary trends you'll likely be noticing along the way. The first is habitual bipedal locomotion. This is a synapomorphy or shared trait of the hominin line, excluding Pan, the chimpanzees. We'll talk about that in a minute. We're also seeing changes in dentition. Generally, we're seeing a reduction in the size of the front teeth, especially the canines, while the molars or cheek teeth increased in size before everything was scaled down even further. And instead of a rectangular box-like layout, the teeth became aligned in a parabolic arc. Next, there is a trend of increasing brain size and a more complex cerebral cortex. This, along with structural changes in the skull, facilitated an increased reliance on sight instead of smell. Finally, we see important behavioral changes, including extended durations of parental care and an increased reliance on learned behaviors. This has led to the emergence of complex culture and eventually language and symbolic art. So now that we've reached the human family tree, we need to clarify some of our terminology. While the word hominin technically includes the genus Pan, there is debate about the exact usage as well as the underlying taxonomy, like how much weight we should place on genetics versus other characteristics. The general convention is that hominin refers to modern humans, extinct humans, and all of our immediate ancestors since diverging with the chimpanzee lineage. The term hominid used to be used in the same way, but now refers to all great apes, the family hominidae. Let's take a closer look at the evolutionary relationships between our own species and other hominins with chimpanzees, pan troglodytes, as the outgroup. The hominin and chimpanzee lineages diverged roughly 7 million years ago, and two of the earliest hominin species were Sahelanthropus chidensis, which lived around the time of this divergence, and Artipithecus ramidus, which lived about 4.4 million years ago. Discovered in Central Africa in 2001, Sahelanthropus chidensis is perhaps the oldest species in the human lineage with a mixture of ape-like and human traits. Like other apes, S. chidensis had a relatively small brain, sloping face, and prominent brow ridge, but like humans, also had relatively small canine teeth and a few other skeletal modifications. Scientists believe that S. chidensis lived in forests and grasslands, and there is evidence that it was bipedal, walked upright on two feet. The evidence is based on the repositioning of the foramen magnum, which is the hole in the back of the head where the spinal cord comes out. The foramen magnum was moved so that the spinal cord exits at the base of the skull instead of out the back. One of the other earliest human species was Artipithecus ramidus, which were likely omnivores but avoided harder, tougher foods like tubers, instead preferring fruits and softer nuts. We can tell this by carefully studying dentition, teeth, and the wear patterns on their enamel. In 2009, a surprisingly complete skeleton of a young female nicknamed Artie was discovered nearing the Owash River in Ethiopia. 
Detailed studies showed that Artie had additional adaptations for bipedal movement, a rigid foot along with changes to the pelvic bones. Regardless, both the foot and pelvis retained other features that were more adaptive for a life in the trees, like a divergent or semi-opposable big toe. And since Artie lived in the forest, this also calls into question the selective pressures for bipedalism, since our understanding is that the greatest pressure was the spread of open, grassy savannas in the cooler and drier climates of the Pliocene. The Australopithecines were a highly successful group, especially the early species Australopithecus afarensis, which lived in eastern Africa from 3.9 to 2.9 million years ago, and Australopithecus africanus, which lived in southern Africa from 3.3 to 2.1 million years ago. One of the most successful species of early humans was Australopithecus afarensis, and the most famous fossil specimen is a 40% complete skeleton of a young female called Lucy. Lucy was discovered in 1974 at a dig site in the Afar region of Ethiopia, which is part of the Great Rift Valley, and she was named after the Beatles song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, which the anthropologist had been listening to a lot on the radio at their base camp. Like other early hominins, Lucy had many ape-like traits, including a flat nose, protruding jaw, and relatively small brain, but like humans, Lucy had small canines, she mostly ate fruits, and we also know that she regularly walked upright on two feet. This is called habitual bipedal locomotion, and there's evidence for this in the form of trace fossils. The Lytoli footprints, a perfectly preserved 3.6 million year old 88 foot walking trail that was left in wet volcanic ash. Lucy had four key skeletal adaptations for habitual bipedal locomotion. The first is a relocated foramen magnum, which is the hole in the back of the head for the spinal cord to emerge from. With the foramen magnum shifted down towards the base of the head, the head can be held vertically for a fuller range of movement while standing. Second, Lucy had a wide basin-shaped pelvis that can function as the center of gravity while also supporting the torso. Third, the femurs point inwards, creating increasing the valgus angle of the knee, which helps shift the center of gravity more easily while in motion. Fourth, there was a non-opposable big toe. With the toes now aligned, this is better for directing downward force towards the ground. Of course, as humans continue to evolve, we will see more and more adaptations related to bipedalism, including more changes to the spine, forelimbs, and hands, which no longer need to be used for knuckle walking and can instead be used for finer applications. But it turns out that Lucy's blend of ape-like and human-like traits are actually what made Australopithecus afarensis so successful. The environment was changing, so it being adapted for life both on the ground and in the canopy allowed the species to survive for nearly one million years in a state of evolutionary stasis. Another highly successful species was Australopithecus africanus. Like afarensis, Africanus also had long arms with curved fingers and shoulders suited for climbing trees, but other adaptations for habitual bipedal locomotion. Africanus, though, continued the evolutionary trend of increasing brain size and changes in dentition. Its teeth were smaller, and based on enamelware, we suspect it had a broader diet than Afarensis, not only eating fruits, but tougher foods as well. Several other early human species are worth noting too, although the relationships among them are not as well understood. Here, we're looking at Paranthropus, a relatively widespread group of robust Australopithecines that lived from roughly 2.6 to at least 1.2 million years ago. Next, we have Australopithecus sediba, 
which lived in southern Africa about 1.98 million years ago. And finally, there are the hobbits, Homo floresiensis, who lived in Indonesia much more recently, from about 100,000 to 50,000 years ago. Paranthropus, or the robust Australopithecines, had large molars with thick enamel, and their faces appeared wide and dish-shaped because of their powerful jaw muscles, wide cheekbones, and prominent sagittal crest. A sagittal crest is a ridge at the top of the skull that runs along the center line, acting as a point of attachment for these powerful jaw muscles. While they were certainly adapted for tough foods like roots and nuts, Paranthropus likely had a more generalist diet like other early humans, and some are known to use unmodified bones as tools to cut or process plants or to extract protein-rich termites for food. Bone tools were carefully hand-selected by Paranthropus and would become smooth and polished after repeated use. One of the last Australopithecus species was Australopithecus sediba, which is thought to be a transition fossil or missing link between Australopithecus and Homo. Sediba continues the pattern of smaller slash reduced dentition along with changes to the pelvis for improved bipedal locomotion. Although by examining Sediba's legs and feet, it appears that this species did have an unusual walking gait, with the ankles leaning sharply inwards. Australopithecus Sediba may have been adapted for both life on the ground and life in the trees, but we don't really know. Standing at about 3 feet 6 inches tall, Homo floresiensis were real-life hobbits. And yes, that's their common name, and there have even been a few disputes with the Tolkien estate after scientists had used the word hobbits in public to promote seminars and so on. But I guess Flora's man just didn't have the same ring to it now, does it? Hobbits lived on the island of Flores in Indonesia from about 100,000 years ago to 60,000 years ago, but there is evidence that their ancestors arrived at least 1 million years ago. The evolutionary origins of hobbits are unclear, though, and the migration event that brought them to Indonesia is also unknown. Flores was still an island at the time, even with the relatively shallow seas, so rafts would have been necessary for oceanic dispersal. And for their evolutionary origins, hobbits are closely related to Australopithecus sediba and Homo habilis, although alternatively they may have split from an early population of Homo erectus. On the island of Flores, there's direct evidence that hobbits were making simple stone tools like points and blades and hunted stegodon, which are related to mammoths and elephants. The ecosystem was already in decline before our own species colonized Flores about 50,000 years ago. Hobbits probably went extinct a few thousand years before our arrival, but if not, they would have quickly disappeared soon after. There are myths that the hobbits might still be alive today, but this is unsubstantiated. Archaic humans are the species in the genus Homo other than us, the modern humans. Two of the earliest archaic humans were Homo habilis, the handyman, which lived in eastern and southern Africa from 2.4 to 1.4 million years ago, and Homo erectus, the upright man, which lived from 1.9 million to 110,000 years ago, and originated in eastern Africa before spreading into northern and southern Africa as well as western and eastern Asia. The archaic human Homo habilis was known as the handyman because they were some of the first to use stone tools. 
While Habilis was still very ape-like in appearance, with long arms, short legs, and pronathism, a forward protruding jaw, they continued the evolutionary trends of reduced dentition and increased cranial capacity. Compared to the earlier Australopithecines, their brain cases were significantly larger, with nearly a 50% increase in volume to a little more than 600 cubic centimeters. For reference, the brain cases of modern humans are nearly 1,400 cubic centimeters. Homo habilis had a broad and varied diet and regularly scavenged meat from animals that had been killed by predators. Marks on these animal bones provide evidence of skinning and removing meat. To carry out this and other work, Homo habilis crafted Oldowan tools, including hammers, choppers, scrapers, and awls. This was the early Stone Age, and there were several hominin species living in coexistence, including Paranthropus boisei, Homo rudolfensis, and Homo erectus. So, Although this technology is largely associated with habilis, an earlier form of this tradition was also used by early Homo and even Paranthropus. And Homo erectus would continue this tradition before replacing it with a more advanced tool-making industry. Homo erectus, the upright man, was tall and slender with relatively modern body proportions, like shorter arms and longer legs. And compared to earlier hominins, there was reduced sexual dimorphism between males and females, which, in other primates, has been associated with monogamy and co-parental care. There's also evidence of single-sex activities in Homo erectus, with males engaging in higher-risk behaviors like defending a territory or hunting large animal prey, often unsuccessfully, I should add. Careful analysis of their teeth has revealed more pits and scratches than on the teeth of earlier hominins, suggesting a very different diet, and it's possible that consuming more animal fats would have allowed them to meet the increasing energy demands of their bigger brains. Homo erectus is believed to be the first hominin to migrate out of Africa, colonizing northern Africa as well as western and east Asia, and possibly Europe, although there's a lot of debate around the specifics. For some time, it was believed that Homo erectus evolved from Homo ergaster, which had been living in eastern and southern Africa perhaps as far back as two million years ago, but the fossil record is a bit more limited. Yet, evidence of Homo erectus in China dates back farther than this, so it might have been a small population of Homo habilis to migrate out of Africa, later becoming Homo erectus with subspecies evolving in China and Indonesia. This would mean that Homo ergaster returned to and spread throughout Africa. Although Homo ergaster is usually classified as Homo erectus sensu lato, so it's the same species as Homo erectus in a broad sense. The technological advancements of Homo erectus included the Acheulean toolkit, which included hand axes and cleavers. Later, some Homo erectus were building simple, hut-like dwellings or inhabiting caves. Homo erectus also took to the seas, and colonizing islands required quite a bit of advanced planning. Another notable achievement was the invention of fire. At first, there were fire keepers who would maintain fires that had been started by a lightning strike or some other natural cause. It wasn't until much later that they would develop the technology for starting their own fires. Fire was originally used for illumination at night, which would not only ward off terrestrial predators, but also provide an opportunity for social socialization eventually leading to more advanced language. Of course, at higher latitudes, fire is also a basic need for warmth. Cooking, though, 
probably wasn't a regular behavior until around 400,000 years ago, but would turn out to be very important since it can make food easier to eat and digest, not to mention safer by controlling foodborne illness. Even foods that were previously inedible could now be processed and eaten. Continuing down the human lineage, we have Homo antecessor, an offshoot species that lived 1.2 million to 0.8 million years ago, and Homo heidelbergensis, which descended from Homo erectus and lived from 700 to 200,000 years ago. Homo antecessor is only known from fossils in Spain, making it one of the first hominins to colonize Western Europe. This pioneer man is an offshoot of the Homo erectus lineage, branching off some time before the evolution of Homo heidelbergensis. Antecessor made Acheulean-like stone tools using simpler techniques, and unlike Homo erectus, there is no evidence that Antecessor controlled fire. Instead, they appear to be biologically adapted for their cooler climate. They probably had a high-protein diet and were not only avid hunters, but also practiced cannibalism. This was probably not ritualistic, though, but actually consistent with optimum foraging theory, since food could be scarce and nothing should be wasted. Homo heidelbergensis was a chrono species that descended directly from African Homo erectus. This might be described as anagenesis or anacladogenesis, depending on whether or not Heidelbergensis completely replaced African erectus. In either case, this would make Homo erectus a paraphyletic species. While direct fossil evidence of Heidelbergensis extends back about 700,000 years, they may have appeared closer to 1 million years ago. Some migrated out of Africa and spread throughout Europe and possibly Asia in a later wave around 0.8 million years ago. Others would have stayed in Africa with their range expanding to include eastern and southern parts of the continent. Technologically, Homo heidelbergensis continued the Acheulean tradition of crafting stone tools, but also invented spears which were used for hunting. Like Homo antecessor, protein was an important part of their diet. Eventually, Heidelbergensis started to construct dwellings with solid foundations and hearths for their fires. Homo heidelbergensis was likely the most recent common ancestor of Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans. Neanderthals descended from European populations of Heidelbergensis eventually expanding west throughout Eurasia, east throughout Eurasia. Homo sapiens evolved from Heidelbergensis in Africa. To quickly review, Homo antecessor was an offshoot from the Homo erectus lineage, and Homo erectus was also a direct ancestor of Homo heidelbergensis, which evolved through anagenesis or cladogenesis. We'll be seeing a similar evolutionary pattern for Denisovans, Neanderthals, and Homo sapiens. In their case, Heidelbergensis was a direct ancestor. In Europe, Homo heidelbergensis gave rise to a sort of pre-Neanderthal lineage roughly 600,000 years ago. This lineage continued to spread throughout Eurasia, eventually evolving into Neanderthals who lived from around 430 to 40,000 years ago, and Denisovans who persisted a bit longer to about 30,000 years ago in parts of East Asia and Oceania. Although there are very few Denisovan fossils, genetics studies have shown that Neanderthals and Denisovans are sister species, more related to each other than to Homo sapiens. This is an important note that I didn't take into account when making this phylogeny here. Denisovans could be found all across Asia during the Middle Paleolithic, 
eventually crossing the Wallace Line and colonizing Papua New Guinea and other parts of Oceania. Unfortunately, there is very little fossil evidence of the Denisovans. We know of tool use, a simpler version of the Mousterian tradition, which includes scrapers and blades, but not much more than that. However, the Denisovans do live on, or at least some of their genes do, because of multiple introgressions with Homo sapiens in Southeast Asia and Oceania. Neanderthals were more robust than modern humans. They were stocky with short limbs, and males, for example, had an average height of about 5 feet 5 inches, or 164 centimeters, and weighed around 143 pounds, or 65 kilos. Neanderthals were also biologically adapted to relatively cold environments. They had different patterns of fat storage and thermogenesis, plus a larger nose, better for warming and humidifying air. Technologically, Neanderthals made many significant advancements, like establishing the Mousterian industry of toolmaking and weaving plant materials into baskets, nets, and clothes. When hunting, Neanderthals would draw from a variety of different strategies that included traps and potentially using spears as projectiles. Fortunately, advances in medicine meant that hunting injuries like broken bones could be treated with splints. There were also treatments for other diseases. Neanderthals had a knowledge of medicinal plants that rivals our own. And since about 70,000 years ago, some Neanderthals began to bury their dead, although this was somewhat uncommon. Neanderthals did have rich cultural traditions, though. While anatomically they were certainly capable of speaking a language, we don't know for sure if they did. And while they may have had art and music, we don't know much about this either. We do know that they were rather fond of ochre, which is an orange or red pigment, and they might have used this as a body paint or for more functional purposes like tanning hides or as an insect repellent. As with Denisovans, there's also been introgression into Homo sapiens, and both Modern Europeans and East Asians share a significant amount of Neanderthal DNA. As a quick recap, pre-Neanderthals evolved from Homo heidelbergensis in Eurasia, eventually spreading to the north and to the east. Introgressions between Neanderthals and Denisovans occurred in Denisova Cave, which is located in the Altai Mountains in Siberia. And interbreeding probably occurred in other parts of Central Asia as well. So after all this, from Sahelanthropus to Australopithecus to Heidelbergensis, we're left with a single species, our own. But just because we're last on this list doesn't mean we're more evolved than any of these other species. We just have a different set of adaptations that matches us to a different niche, a different environment. Modern humans arose in Africa about 300,000 years ago, and by studying mitochondrial DNA, we know that all living humans shared a single great-great-great-great-great-grandmother who lived roughly 200,000 years ago. Anatomically modern humans lived from about 300,000 years ago until the appearance of behavioral modernity by about 50,000 years ago, but this shift probably occurred around 60 or 70,000 years ago, or even as much as 160,000 years ago. Behavioral modernity represents a major cultural transition without a corresponding change in our fundamental biology. This is an emergence of fully developed language, established social norms, abstract thought, as well as symbolism and the arts, like painting, music, and dance. This cognitive shift kicked off the Upper Paleolithic, the later Stone Age. 
behavioral modernity likely drove the expansion and migration of modern humans out of Africa. Before this time, there had already been a successful expansion throughout Africa around 120,000 years ago, and this was followed by an ultimately unsuccessful migration into Eurasia. Later, 70,000 years ago, there was coastal migration from East Africa into West, South, and Southeast Asia and Oceania. Another wave left Africa from the Northwest, entering Eurasia about 50,000 years ago. By 40,000 years ago, modern humans had expanded into Europe as well as East Asia, and by 25,000 years ago, modern humans were colonizing Beringia, which was an area between Alaska and Chukotka in the Russian Far East that had been connected by a land bridge during the last glacial maximum around 19,000 years ago. Humans reached North America by 16,000 years ago and South America by 14,000 years ago. Remember, modern humans were not alone in the world. After migrating out of Africa, they would interbreed with Denisovans en route to East Asia and Oceania and with Neanderthals in the Near East or Eastern Mediterranean. But this also raises another important point. What happened to the Neanderthals and Denisovans? And what about Homo erectus and Homo floresiensis? Throughout the roughly four-ish million year history of hominins, there have usually been around three to five coexisting species at any given time, so it's certainly possible that the cultural practices of modern humans contributed to the disappearance of the other hominins. And as our story continues, we begin domesticating animals, cultivating plants, making ceramics, inventing written language and writing books, and continuously evolving in terms of cultural practices and norms. Our growing populations have also been fueled by coal, electricity, and nuclear power, and this is only the beginning. I don't have plans to make a part three to this video series anytime soon, but the story of behaviorally modern humans and the thought of what might happen to us in the future is really fascinating to me. So with that, that's all for today's video. Be sure to like and subscribe if you're interested in this kind of content, if it helps you study for class or just learn a bit more about where we all come from. As always, thank you for watching, and if you have any questions, they're worth asking, so leave a comment or feel free to reach out to me in any way.